webinar. My name is Alec, and as always, I'm here today to help answer any of your general or technical questions that may come up. But before we get started, I'm going to cover, cover a couple of things that you should know before the session starts. There's no dial-in number for attendees. All audio will be streamed to you through your computer speakers or headphones. Please adjust your volume there accordingly. You can submit questions, and we do encourage you to do so at any point during today's presentation by clicking on the Q&A icon located on the right-hand side of your screen. Just click there. You can see what that looks like here on this slide. Type in that question and click Submit. If it's content related, we should have some time at the end for questions, and we'll pull a couple of attendee questions at that point. If it's a technical question, I'll have an answer for you that should appear on your screen shortly after you submit. Feel free right now to jump in there and let us know where you're joining from, just to familiarize yourself with that Q&A tool if you'd like. We already have a ton of people doing so. We have people from Texas, Washington, Tennessee, right here in Chicago, Boston, Canada, California. So welcome to all of you. Um, thanks for joining in. Like I said, if you want, you can feel free to familiarize yourself with the Q&A tool by clicking in there and letting us know where you're joining from. I already have a couple of people asking this, but you can download a PDF of the slide deck right now. Just click on the handout icon on the right-hand side of your screen. It should be located right by the Q&A icon. You can see what that handout icon looks here with that second bottom arrow. Just click there and you can pull down a PDF to follow along and take notes if you'd like. The webinar today is being recorded. You're going to receive a link to that recording in a follow-up email about 24 hours after the conclusion of today's event. That will come from HCM Events, and in that same email, you'll have a link to the slides, a link to the recording, and your HRCI and SHRM certification codes for today's event. All right, so we're going to get things started, but before we do, I want to take this time to thank Building Champions for sponsoring today's CLO webinar. I've done some work with Building Champions in the past on uh, previous webinars, and it's always a pleasure to work with the folks there. So thanks again to Building Champions for sponsoring today's event. All right, and with us today, we have our guest speaker, Dan Foster. Throughout his career, Dan has successfully helped executive, executives, small business owners, and sales professionals increase their influence, make better decisions, and achieve the results they desire. He loves helping leaders live and lead with greater intentionality and purpose. In addition to coaching leaders and teams, Dan manages a team of building champions, executive coaches, and leads internal coach training and development. He also oversees client relationships in the retail, technology, hospitality, healthcare, and telecommunications industries. So with all that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and get things started. Dan, go ahead and take it away. All right, Alec, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for taking time today to, to be on the call. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Um, you know, this topic is just extremely uh, important for me and it's something I'm extremely passionate about for a couple of reasons. One, over the past 10 years of coaching and leading in organizations, I have seen managers transform into coaching leaders with great success. I know it can be done. It's not just theory to me. I've seen it improve both culture and results dramatically. And secondly, I personally have experienced this transformation myself through coaching and training and believe me, a lot of trial and error. I shifted my approach to leadership and in doing so, I was able to experience a level of connection and engagement with my team that I didn't really know was possible. And together, we were able to achieve results that were really amazing. We were recognized nationally for our performance and, and most importantly, for the experience that we gave our customers together. So that's why I love this topic. And when Daniel asked me to fill in for him today uh, because of a client need that took him to Japan uh, unexpectedly, it was really a no-brainer for me and it's truly my pleasure. So my hope today is that you will see the value in investing in this type of leadership strategy for your organization. It's not going to solve all of your problems around engagement or performance or results or anything, but it can be one of the best arrows that you have in your quiver to help you with overall engagement within your organization. So let's begin by getting our arms around this whole idea around shifting managers to coaches. And is this worth our time and, 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 and efforts to discuss this. And I don't know about you, but it's often that I think I see people are creating solutions to problems 
that really don't exist. Just with the hope that I'll end up buying their book or listening to their podcast or investing in their training. But as leaders in our organizations that are responsible for development and training, we have to make sure what we're focused on truly makes the lives of our people better. It drives results and it just improves overall engagement. So let's look at some of the data and see what it's, what's really going on with our people, our managers, and how we can improve engagement, culture, and, and I think results. So in the latest State of the American Workforce Report from Gallup Research, some, there, there are some alarming stats. Almost two thirds of our employees are showing up for work, not committed to delivering their best performance. They're showing up, which is great, but they're essentially saying, I'll give my best sometimes, but you know, probably deliver the minimum requirements to keep me employed and keep getting that paycheck. That's not the type of culture that high performers want to be a part of. And we're going to slowly lose the great talents in our organizations if this stat continues to be true year after year. Imagine a professional sports team where two-thirds of the starting players were not fully committed to giving their best night after night, game after game. The players who are committed would probably start to look for another team. They'd start to raise some complaints. They'd start to push for trades. We'll play this scenario out into the most vital industries in our economy and in our culture, our personal lives, healthcare, technology, military, social services, education. I want those individuals, those employees for those industries, I want them to be fully engaged. And when they're not, we've got a problem in our hands. So let's dig a little bit deeper. And unfortunately, it doesn't get better, the news here. 13% of employees are actively disengaged, which means they're working against your interest. And Gallup defines working against your interest as being less productive, they're more likely to steal, they're negatively influencing other coworkers, and they're actually driving customers away from the business. And they estimate that the cost of these 13% was around $550 billion, $550 billion in lost productivity. Now, I'm going to let you do the math for your company. I know we've got large and small companies on the call today, but if you're representing a company with 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 employees, do that math real quick on 13%, no matter what size your organization is. If you even just have one or two people that are actively disengaged, we've got a problem. This problem of engagement, it directly impacts our organizational vision that we're trying to go after, the mission that we're trying to engage in every single day, and the strategies that we're, we're trying to execute on. And if we can be better at engaging our employees, we can improve our culture, performance, and results. You know, our belief at Building Champions, and, and really it's my belief as well, is that we can change this trend by creating coaching cultures. And we believe that coaching cultures are one of the most powerful things that an organization can do to transform its managers, improve the overall experience of its employees. And we believe that because they're, they're twice as likely to be classified as high-performing organizations. They outperform their peers in things like internal mobility, bench strength, diversity hires, and just retention of those high performers that we were talking about. And believe it or not, they actually score as, as high as 30% higher on employee engagement scores. So the bottom line for us is that companies with coaching cultures, they actually perform better. Question is, where do we start? Where can we focus our training and development to have the highest ROI and really make a difference in the lives of our employees, our managers, and our organization? Well, let, let's go back to that Gallup data because actually the answer is in their research. And I don't think it's gonna surprise you when you learn that whether a team or a department scores high or low, at least 70% of the variance in those scores 
are directly attributed to the employee's manager. It's that, it's that age-old principle where, where people work for companies, but in the end, it comes down to do they feel connected, engaged to the manager? People don't leave companies. They, they leave leaders. So the solution seems to be that if we can focus on this manager, then we can help to transition and transform the level of engagement that is going on within our organizations. And that might sound easy. Some of you might be like, well, yeah, of course it's the manager. No problem. Well, we've got some hurdles, though, that we've got to jump over if we're going to truly do this. Because 77% of managers, they actually think they're doing a great job at engaging their people. But if that's the case, why are these other numbers so high or so low? Well, it turns out that employees are seeing things just a little bit differently. Only 12% said they felt their managers were doing the, enough to engage them. That means 88% are saying it's not enough. I'm not giving the level, getting the level of engagement that I want from my manager. And here's the thing, this is the worst stat. When I read this, I was like, oh man, so convicting. Two thirds of employees said they would forego a pay raise to see their manager fired. Ow, ouch. Well, what do we do with these stats? I, again, we've been doing this for, for 20 years. As Alex said in the, the intro there, coaching leaders and helping organizations build coaching cultures. And we knew this at a gut level, but what Gallup had summed up in their research on managers and engagement. But they essentially said that if you can work with your managers to help them to become an effective coach, it is the most important skill that they can develop. And it can transform your organization. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about how can you bring your managers along to help them become coaching leaders. And it starts, I think, with us addressing one trend that has to be stopped. And that trend is promoting high performers into management positions simply because they're high performers. We have to start asking ourselves, is this person able to lead people? It has to be a combination of both performance and leadership that we look for in people that we want to train and equip to become coaching leaders. A study at careerbuilder.com found that over 58% of people that were recently promoted into management positions received zero management training. 58% of those that we're promoting and they don't get any formal management training. They're simply dropped right into that position and said and told, go lead people. You were a high producer, I bet you can lead people, no problem. No, no leadership training no engagement training, no communication training. And this is a huge miss for our organizations, but it's also a great opportunity for us as chief learning officers and HR leaders to change this trend by focusing on building coaching cultures and investing in training that really helps to move that manager, transition them, transform them into a coaching leader. So let's look at how you can do that effectively. Again, our experience and our research in this area, it's really helped us to identify four areas for you to focus on when you're developing the efforts of your managers. And those four areas are the mindset of a coaching leader, the skills, the focus, and the structure of coaching leaders. And we're going to look at each of those uh, individually here. So let's start with mindset. You know, a lot of leadership development training, it focuses solely on the behaviors of great leadership. It'll be a list of steps to follow and ways to communicate and actions to take regularly, and it's all great stuff. In fact, we use it every day in our coaching. But if we only focus on behaviors, we miss an essential part of the leadership equation that leads to high engagement and performance and those results that we're looking for. And that missing part is mindset. And it all starts on the inside. It's the most effective, the most effective leadership development. It focuses both on the mindset 
and the behaviors of great leadership. It takes into account the thinking and the feeling and the beliefs of people and how those directly impact the actions that they're taking, the results that they're achieving, and the influence that they have on people. And the most effective managers that become coaching leaders, they dedicate time to reflect on and adjust and ensure that their mindset positively impacts their behaviors, the results, and the relationships. And at the core of an effective coaching leader mindset is this understanding of the whole person, that you really can't separate who you are personally from who you are professionally. And I think deep down inside, we all know this to be true. I've experienced it myself where you show up for the Monday morning meeting and you're, you try to separate the fight that you had with your, the, your spouse over the weekend, the struggle maybe that you're having with your kids, the, the lack of sleep or the lack of exercise. And we realize as we get there, oh man, I'm not ready for this meeting. I'm disengaged. And it just impacts every area of our life, both personally and professionally. And it's how we show up in our leadership. Coaching leaders, they get this and they demonstrate care for their team members when they acknowledge and lead the whole person as well. Well, research discovered that only four in 10 US employees strongly agree that their supervisor or someone at work actually cares about them as a person. So let me ask you, do, do the people who work for your organization, do they feel cared for? Do they see their manager as someone who truly knows them and cares for them? If not, then we need to help your managers examine their beliefs, uh, first of all, uh, about themselves. Do they see themselves as more than just managers, but people developers, helping their team members to become the best versions of themselves? What about their beliefs about their people? Do they, do they believe their people are worth knowing and caring about? And are they, do they believe that they actually can change and be developed? And what about the organization? What are they believing about the organization? Do they believe that it will support this type of leadership and provide the resources to help them truly become coaching leaders? When we have that inner compass set with our mindset, then we can start to move forward into that next area of focus, which is helping our managers really sharpen a key set of skills. And there's really three primary skills that we believe must be mastered by coaching leaders. But at the foundation of each of these skills is one thing, and it's trust. You could be excellent at the mechanics of each of these skills. You may have read books, listened to interviews. You may be known for this throughout your organization. You go to classes, you maybe even teach classes. But if your managers do not have at the foundation of their relationship with their team members, this idea of trust, they will never truly become an effective coaching leader. To build trust, team members have to be able to answer yes to each of these questions. One, do you know me? Do you understand my role? And are you for me? They want, that's what they're asking about managers. If they're going to trust them, if they're going to be able to give them permission to speak into their lives, to coach them and develop them, they have to know that they are known. They have to know that their manager understands their role. They have to know that their manager is for them. And that is what we believe leads to trust. When they answer those things positively, and when trust is the foundation, then you can start to work on sharpening these skills. The first one is effective communication. Coaching leaders understand their own unique communication style what's unique about them and how they, how they communicate. They can recognize the communication style of others that they're working with. And then here's, this is where the payoff is. They can adapt their communication style to help ensure that there's effective communication and that people feel heard and understood. 
And they do this through through the, the communication skills of practicing active listening, asking powerful questions of the people they lead. They use storytelling to help people see what could be and, and think through options. And they drive to clarity around those important issues so that there's no confusion about what success looks like or, or what the path is gonna look like to get there. In our coaching leader training, we tell people, here's the thing, aim to do no more than 30% of the talking and ask the right questions to keep your employee talking 70% of the time. When, they, when your managers are doing one-on-one, -on -one, if you ask them about them and they're like, well, I talked about this and this and this, and they go on and on, and it sounds like they did all the talking, we've got to flip that. 30% of the time they talk, 70% of the time the employee. The next key skill is powerful feedback. Some more stats for you here. 98% of employees will fail to be engaged when managers offer little or no feedback. And only 30% strongly agree that they received recognition or praise for doing good in this last seven days. You know, feedback is tough. I was on the phone with a client this morning and the, the gentleman told me, he said, Dan, I haven't heard from my direct supervisor in six months in terms of how I'm doing. And this is a high performing individual. And too often we believe that the high performers don't need feedback. They're doing a good job. They don't want to be talked to. Let's just let them do their thing. Let's focus on this, 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 this group of people that aren't performing well and we'll give them the feedback. The feedback doesn't have to always be negative. It can be both affirming, constructive, redirecting. It can praise those individuals that are high performers. We can talk to them about where they can improve, demonstrating that you care enough to invest in them. And I know it can be uncomfortable, but these communication, this, this feedback, it's so important and it's essential. The third one is leveraging goals. Goals can be highly useful in motivating people and keeping them on track. If they're used appropriately, though, too often managers spend all their time setting goals and not enough time on two, uh, I think, overlooked components. How will they achieve them and how will people monitor those goals? So when talking through goals with people, we have to make sure that we've thought through everything that's necessary to actually hit the goal. And rather than waiting to see if people hit their goal at the deadline, coaching leaders stay involved during the process. They ask great questions about the progress and how things are going. They help their people understand the milestones and the key steps along the way so that they get a true picture of where they're at. They're available for questions and troubleshooting if needed, and they're just constantly asking, hey, is there anything I can do to help you? This type of involvement, it not only improves the ongoing accountability, but it also greatly increases the likelihood of success. So here are some more stats on this. Only 30% of employees strongly agree their managers involve them in setting their goals at work. And those who strongly agree with this statement are actually three and a half times more likely than other employees to be engaged. So what do we take from that? Managers, don't set goals for your team members. Bring them into the process. Help them set goals. Make it something that you're doing together in dialogue, in a coaching session. Don't just walk up and say, here's your goals for the quarter. It's not gonna lead to engagement. Okay, the third area is that we have to focus, coaching leaders get really good at focusing their efforts. And we, this is where I wanna spend the majority of our time today because we believe there are four big conversations that are most likely to promote connection and relationship building between you and your employees. And I think if you do these right, I have seen personally that they will boost employee engagement and they will drive those results like we've talked about. So the first big conversation topic is well-being. When leaders demonstrate that they care for their employees by asking them about their overall well-being, it has a significant impact on their engagement. Gallup surveyed over 600 HR leaders and 97% of you out there 
told them that employee well-being directly affects employee engagement at work. And when employees and their leaders, when they focus on increasing their well-being, guess what? Leads to 19% increase in personal productivity. Leads to 21% in team productivity. This well-being is, is, is super important. And now the idea of so, sort of focusing on these types of conversations, they, it can be a little bit confusing at times, and maybe some misunderstanding. I know it was for me when I first started trying to do this. It was even a little awkward, to be honest with you. So I think it's good for us to define what we mean by well-being. There's three essential areas here. The first one is physical. And this is just all about a, a leader that is concerned about the physical health, practicing healthy lifestyles, helping people with their eating, sleeping, rest, making sure that, that they're getting the best uh, rest that they can. They're proactively supporting the physical well-being in their team culture. They, what does this look like? Because it's not like we want people to stand on scales when they walk into the office every day. That's not going to happen. You guys, HR, they would go nuts over that. No, it's like having healthy snacks at meetings. It's having fun competitions. It's maybe doing some outdoor activities together. But it's being concerned about their overall physical well-being. Next, the social side of things. It's grounded in this whole idea of work-life balance. And people define the, the social well-being as you have the presence of quality, positive interactions, both at work and at home. So that means from a leadership standpoint, you're making sure and you're having a core value of your team culture be where there's positive interactions. And when there's negative ones, you make sure that it remains in healthy conflict and not unhealthy conflict. And if there is unhealthy, you address it. You take care of it because you understand that those relationships are essential for the well-being of every individual on your team and the overall engagement that they have. And then third, there's the emotional side of things. And this really comes down to purpose, finding meaning in what your employees do, liking what they do, and seeing how the work that they do is aligned to their personal and organizational values. And we're gonna talk about that more in a little bit. But that's what the emotional well-being is all about. Do they believe the work that they're doing matters? Are they connected to it? Are they emotionally connected to it? And do they see the benefit that it has on the organization and the community? The next big conversation after well-being is around vision. And there's some alarming stats here that I, I, I wish were, were not true, but Guys, 78% of employees, they're not sure that leadership even has a clear direction for the organization. They don't know what the vision is. And I don't know if that's because of a lack of communication, but I do know that 51% said three months before they left, no one spoke to them about their job satisfaction or even their future within the organization. So we've got a serious issue here around communicating vision. And the big conversation around vision, it starts with organizational vision. And that is the responsibility of every coaching leader. They have to be able to explain what the vision is, what the mission is, what the purpose is and the core values are of the organization on a regular basis. This isn't done by putting a poster up on a, on a conference room wall. This isn't done by having an email signature with a tagline or a few of the core values. This isn't done once every six months. This is done daily in coaching sessions, one-on-ones as you're walking the hall. This is done in team meetings every week, quarterly. It's just, it's something that, it doesn't happen by default. It happens by design. And coaching leaders have to be the main communicators of vision. Otherwise, it will not trickle down through the organization. 
they also have to be able to communicate and explain how the team's work aligns to and supports the overall organizational vision. Again, people want to know that the work they're doing together and collaborating on, that it's going for a bigger purpose and it's helping the organization succeed. And then finally, when employees, when they understand how they personally contribute to the overall vision, they'll find their work more meaningful. They'll be more likely to buy into the message and do what it takes to meet those personal and team goals. Now, again, I, I mentioned this already. This is not a one-off task. It has to be reviewed regularly to ensure that it's that in every um, instance from team to personal work that it's reflecting the organization's priorities. You have to repeat it often. As soon as you think that you've communicated vision enough as a coaching leader, you've got to go communicate it more. Okay, the next area is around execution. And this is the third of the big four conversations. This is an area where managers really struggle. And for some reason, I think it's a comfort level around holding people accountable to performance. For others, it's about making it simply a priority. What we do know is that it doesn't happen as often as it should. In fact, 21% of employees strongly agree that their performance is managed in a way that motivates them to do outstanding work. Only 21%. We've got to get that number up higher. So what does it look like in execution? How do your managers do this? How can they get better at having these types of conversations? Well, this step is really all about making sure that each member of your team knows what a win looks like. It's about creating alignment between the company's goals, your team goals, and the individual's goals. They need to know what's expected of them and have clarity around the specific deliverables that are responsible for owning, that they're owning and they're driving. And so in, in today's fast paced and just ever changing environment, this can be really difficult at times. We've got competing priorities, we've got projects, we've got politics that sometimes get in the way. And one of your jobs as a coaching leader is to help break through all that clutter and make sure that people are in the best position that they can be to succeed. So rather than use complicated systems, planning structures to make this all hap happen, make it as simple as you possibly can for your people to focus on what's most important and tune out the things that get in the way. Secondly, You've got to provide. Um, you've got to provide support. Um, you, you give them what they need to get the job done. Time, money, resources, but also be there for them. Allow them to ask questions. Don't tell them what to do, but but share insights, share past experiences, guide them to learn along the way how to do that job effectively, and monitor the progress. That's, that, that's the third thing here. You've got to monitor the progress by being diligent about asking for progress updates. It just it shows you care and, and that you're willing to offer help where it's needed. Don't shy away for asking them about due dates, getting those updates on the progress and helping your team see where their work is actually headed and leading. So you've got to define the win, make sure success is clearly defined and that, it, that you're both aligned on it provide that support, and then monitor that progress. Having conversations in your one-on-ones about that is essential. Okay, the fourth big conversation that you've got to have is around productivity. This last area, this is where all things come together, in my opinion. You, you've helped your people create plans for their well-being. They've got their business goals. They've got clarity on their role and how they contribute to the success of the team and the organization and, and where they'll, they'll be investing their time to grow and develop themselves. But getting everything done, we all know this, it can be a lot easier said than done, actually. And this is where you can flex really those coaching muscles and help to ensure that your employees really have clarity on what's most important for them to focus on. 
that they've created the, the time and the space to get it done, and that they're ruthlessly empowered to say no to things that kind of get in the way. So what are some stats on this? 47, these are kind of alarming too, 40% of waking hours people spend thinking about something other than what they're doing. So there's a lot of ADD distraction going on right there. Another stat, 7%, this is a little scary, most productive in the office during regular working hours. Why is that? Only 7% of our employees said that they're most productive in the office during normal working hours. I got to think it's because of all the distractions that are out there. The got a minute type meetings. Um, hey, we, we thought you should be in this meeting, even though, you know, you're not really involved, but we just like to fill the conference room or something. We have to help our employees with this. And it starts with helping them to understand their high payoff activities. These are the activities that bring the most value to their role, the team, and maybe the organization. We have to make sure that they see these with clarity and we push them to either delegate or delete those tasks that can get in their way. Secondly, it's all about saying no, setting boundaries. You have to empower your people to say no to activities that will get in their way of adding the most value. Whether it be a meeting or a new project, coach them to think through the implications of taking on something new. Make sure that they count the cost that it's going to have on them, both personally as well as professionally, if they are spread too thin by, do, by saying yes to this. There's a great saying that we have here at Building Champions. I, I don't think we came up with it, but it's sometimes you have to say no to the good so that you can say yes to the great. And this is a key principle here. It's okay to say no to good things so that you can say yes to the great things and the right things that help you have the greatest impact on the organization and your goals. And finally, they've got to block out time to focus on these high payoff activities and protect it. As coaching leaders, you have to coach them to create this ideal week of, of how they would want to invest their time if they could spend it in the most efficient and effective way possible. And while that may not always be able to be achieved, having a target to shoot for is really the first step. So in summary, big four conversations around well-being, vision, execution, and productivity. If we can have our one-on-ones with your managers and their direct reports focused on these big four, Oh my gosh, it's going to radically change the culture of your organization. You're going to see engagement skyrocket. But it does, again, it doesn't happen by default. There's got to be a design to it. You've got to build some structure. And you can know exactly what you need to do as a coaching leader. And you can have all of the very best intentions, but the literal act of coaching, it just doesn't happen by accident. And unfortunately, the best intentions, they fail especially when leaders become bogged down by new priorities, the latest crisis, fires that have got to be put out. Being a coaching leader requires you to be more focused and intentional in how you interact with your employees. It requires you to prioritize that connection piece we talked about and build it into your routine. Even if that is scheduling time each day to informally connect with employees to show them that you, that you care, that they matter to you. So let's look at how they do this effectively. Well, it starts with one-on-one -on -one meetings. I've been mentioning that already in the talk here. We have to prioritize our one-on-one -on -one meetings. You should be scheduling, as coaching leaders, you should be scheduling regular one-on-one -on -one meetings between you and your employees that are specifically dedicated to their personal growth, career development, and performance. And if you manage remote employees, well then you can use video conferencing software for this. So you don't, you, you may not only hear, but you can see each other, okay? But you have to prioritize the one-on-ones. And here's the thing, if you cancel, you never cancel a one-on-one. -on -one. You always reschedule it. 
Because if you're canceling the one-on-one as a coaching leader, what you're essentially saying to that individual is, I'm too busy for you this week. I don't have time to talk to you or invest in you. And you know what? Let's just cancel this one. We'll, p- we'll pick up in the next two weeks or the next month when we get together for our one-on-one. That speaks volumes to your employees. So never, ju- never cancel. Always, always, always reschedule your one-on-one. You have to focus on the systems and disciplines. You won't, and really you can't, remember every single thing about every conversation that you have with each of your employees. That's why you need a a standard set of processes uh, uh, for how you document your coaching sessions, how you take notes on what what you're talking about and what matters most to them, following up with them, talking about their goals and measuring progress and ultimately holding them accountable. Plus, here's the thing about taking notes. The simple act of taking notes has huge added benefits. It forces you as an individual to pay more attention to what the other person is saying. It it creates that second level of active listening where you're truly trying to understand everything that this person is saying. It also helps with great follow-up questions to press in after the session is over. Okay, and then third, you have to invest in yourself. This is a part of the structure and the systems of being a coaching leader. You have to make your own growth and development a priority. You have to create a personal development plan for yourself that calls out how you're going to grow in your role and your leadership and your skills and your influence. You have to identify those gaps where training or development could help you. Set the standard for your team that development is a priority for every team member, including yourself. After all, you you really can only give away what you possess. Okay, so you've got to walk the talk. Your people are always watching you. And if they see you saying one thing, but doing another in your own leadership, this is not going to work. It's going to fail miserably. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how we work with coaching leaders and the tools we have and the resources that we have. And so we have a a website here that's been set up for the CLO webinar. And on there, you can get a copy of the PowerPoint. We've got two eBooks that we're making available to you. One is called, called Your Guide to Coaching Leadership. There is a coaching leadership assessment on there where you can assess how you and your people are doing. I'd encourage you to have a few of your managers take it. You take it yourself. See where you stack up as a coaching leader. And the second ebook that we have is Building a Coaching Culture Guide. And it's a blueprint that really just helps you to follow some basic steps to help you build that coaching culture within your organization. So I know we've got some time set aside um, for for questions, Alex. So I want to uh, make myself available. Happy to answer any questions that may have come in. All right, Dan. Yeah, while we're waiting for a couple questions here to come in, uh, I'll just reiterate the fact that today's webinar was being recorded. Everybody's going to receive a link to that recording in a follow-up email about 24 hours after this webinar ends. Uh, please keep your eyes open for that. It'll come from HCM Events. In that same email, you'll have a link to the recording, a link to the slides, as well as your HRCI and SHRM certification codes if you attended live today. All right, so we'll give it here a minute for a couple questions to come in. We currently don't have any. We had a lot of comments coming in, um, but no questions yet. So we'll give it a minute or so here, Dan. Yeah, you know. (laughs) Absolutely, Alec. Absolutely. You know, and as people are maybe you know, signing off or thinking about questions. Um, Like I said at the beginning, I went through this myself. Um, I was a young leader. I was put into my management position for the first time. I had around 45 people that I was overseeing in a department, and I had no idea what I was doing. Every single bit of my management training was around driving results. There was nothing about communication, nothing about engagement, nothing about culture. 
there was about driving results and I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and I had the highest turnover in my department for the entire organization. I had 17 people leave in one year. And I remember the CEO calling me saying, what in the world is going on in your department right now? And it was in that moment where I realized that everything I'd ever read in a book, everything, all the training that I had, it was, it was great when it came to performance and driving results, but nothing prepared me for how to coach and lead and, and, and change culture and, and focus on the well-being of my people and help to improve engagement. And it wasn't until I started really zeroing in on becoming a coaching leader that it really started to transform things. So I want to let you know that it's not easy, but it is possible. And, and that's where I, that why I love what I get to do now is because I get to help people uh, walk through that themselves. So just wanted to share that here at the end. Yeah, thank you for that, Dan. And while, while you were, we had um, probably about uh, 40 to 50 questions flood in. So I'm trying to sort through awesome. these here best I can. <laughs> um, we definitely have plenty to take us until the end of today's webinar. So um, one common theme across all these questions that I'm noticing, not all of them rather, but just quite a few, and it's about getting management uh, buy-in. And uh, we'll start with this one. I'm going to take Emily's, but like I said, we had a ton of people asking the same question. So Emily's question is, how do you get the buy-in from leaders who don't necessarily want to change their man management styles or think that they need to? Yeah, I, I think this is where you you have to use the stats. And, and this is where I think Gallup totally has been opening the minds and the hearts of people, managers, HR leaders, chief learning officers around the, the country. Um, and their book, It's the Manager, is a, it's sort of like, you know, the a report that Congress would give on something that, that, that has happened that isn't good for the country. It's like one of those types of reports. And it essentially says to managers, guys, gals, this is, it's about you. It's about the way you're engaging. It's, it's how you're leading. That is, it's actually negatively impacting the engagement levels that are out there. And so I think you present the stats and it's hard for people to argue with stats. And people may say, I don't have to do this. Well, then do a 360, you know, uh, do a 360 assessment with them. Let them hear from their peers. Let them hear from their direct reports. Let them hear from their boss and their boss's boss. Let them get that verbatim feedback as well as the scores on how they're doing as a leader so that they can see that. And hopefully that will open their eyes um, because we can show them stats that that engagement leads to higher levels of production, better results, overall culture. And you just have to ask them, is that something you want as a leader? Do you want to get better? Do you always want to be improving or are you okay with status quo? And if they're okay with status quo and they don't think they need to change, that's a mindset issue. That's a belief issue. And you have to really decide whether or not that, if someone has such a fixed mindset around that, they may not be the right fit for your organization. All right, great. Um, this one comes from Susan. Susan's question is, how do you avoid the mindset of promoting the high performers and how do you assess the leadership potential? Yeah, great question. Um, so I, I think, first of all, I don't want to disparage high performers because we, we need high performers, but I don't know about you, but I, I've just seen this trend um, where that those they're the only people that get um, nominated for promotions. And I think it starts with a different process for nominating people for promotion. I think it starts with being intentional and purposeful um, when you're in that identification process and you have a clear criteria that you're looking for so that when someone says, you know, I think Jennifer would be a great person to promote, she's knocking it out of the park in terms of sales or, uh, you know, increasing market share in her region, great. Well, how is she doing, again, from a people standpoint? Is it Would a 360 assessment work here as well? Would... Um, some uh, a, a basic training that that goes on a, a that is a part of the process for someone 
that uh, that is going to be nominated for promotion? Is there, are there interviews that can be done? But you have to be intentional and purposeful, I believe, uh, at the start so that it's not just, well, we've got five nominations. Let's go with the highest performing one and they're in. Um, but it's it's taking time. It's being purposeful and intentional, knowing that the decision that you're about to make is going to have a direct impact on engagement and culture and overall well-being of the people that are working for the organization. So if that's a core value of yours, of engagement and a thriving culture and the well-being of your employees, you point it to that and say, we need to change our process for how we select people for promotion. Not saying we exclude high performers, but what we do is, is we have, we're more intentional on the front side, asking questions, doing interviews, uh, doing some assessments. And really that coaching leader assessment may be a great one for you because if they're truly a people developer, you're gonna see evidence of it. You're gonna see them involved either within the organization or outside the organization in ways where you recognize that they just have a heart for people and people development. It, it, there will be fruit that you can see that they're bearing there. And, and if you don't see that, I, I think you, you wanna call it into question and just wonder, hey, what are you doing to, to develop others and to build into others? Tell us what you've been doing. All right, Dan, thank you. We have a lot coming in around the uh, this next question, so I'm just going to kind of lump all these together. So, um, Angela, this one this one comes from Angela, um, but like I said, we had a lot of people asking uh, very similar things. So, what do you recommend uh, for managing up to help your managers be better? Yeah, managing up. Oh my gosh. I wish I had the solution for this. I'd be a, a best-selling author and millionaire probably. Um, <laughs> uh, probably the number one thing that, that, we, um, that we have in, from the coach's chair when we're dealing with the director, vice president level. Um, I, here's the thing. I think it starts in, in this area of really having a vision for an organization, part of the organizational vision has to be around people development. And if that's not a core value, if it's not a part of your, your a key area in your vision, you have to press as a chief learning officer, as an HR representative, whatever your role is, push to have that be a part of the vision. Because essentially what happens is, is people at the highest levels, um, they will say, well, HR and chief learning officers, that's your job to develop, but it's, it doesn't ever become a strategic um, objective of the organization to help it grow and be scalable and sustainable. And so I think the, what happens is when it does become a part of the vision, now you have a mandate to scale leadership throughout the organization. And if you're going to scale leadership, um, it, it truly is something that is strategic because you have to keep up with the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, and the ambiguity, the VUCA aspects of the world. You have to keep up with those because if you don't, from a scaling leadership standpoint, you will be left behind and you will put a cap on where you can grow and where you can develop and, and how you can grow the organization. So if you can help your senior leaders to understand that the world is only becoming more complex and the way we do business, there's more uncertainty, there's volatility. And if we don't scale our leadership to keep it ahead of that curve, then we are doing a disservice to the long-term vision of the company. And so we have to make this a priority. And it starts by getting those senior leaders to recognize that it's a, a long-term strategic objective of the organization to invest in leadership development and scaling that leadership so that you're always ahead of that, that wave of volatility, uncertainty, and complexity and ambiguity. All right. Uh, thank you, Dan. And this one almost, it kind of connects in, in, in some ways, but this one comes from Leslie. And the question is, in your experience, does the development of a coaching culture need to be driven top down or can it be grown from wherever the organization, mm -hmm. um, wherever in the organization, the natural energy and desire are found? 
Yeah, great, great question. So we've seen it in, through experience. Um, I will tell you the ideal is that it is from the top down, just like I was describing, where it has to become a part of the vision and it has to be signed off on by uh, the senior leadership team for the organization. That's the ideal. And we've seen it work beautifully. When it does, we've got some great case studies. We've got some great uh, chief learning officers we can put you in touch with, some HR people if you want to hear how that all played out. I do want to say, though, that it can also happen organically. It just takes a lot longer. There's more frustration. But what I love about the organic growth is that it, it, it's, it's, I love seeing, I love seeing the look on a senior leader's face when they see the numbers of the manager in some region that said, I'm going to invest in becoming a coach and I'm going to build a coaching culture in my region. And all of a sudden they see turnover go down, engagement go up, production go up, you know, financially, everything is just humming and doing great. And all of a sudden that senior leader is going like, what in the world is going on over there? Somebody get on the phone with Susie and find out what she's doing differently than everybody else. I love that organic sort of growth of coaching leadership where your peers start to call you and say, what are you doing? How can I help, you know, how can I learn what you're doing and, and, and have the impact in my region or in my department? I love that. I think that's a much better story, <laughs> right? Because you're, you're, the, you're the hero that has grown it organically. But I will tell you for the most effective results, the fastest results, the results that you see happen in every department because it's been pushed from the top down, that is the ideal. All right, Dan, we have time for one more, and this one is going to come from Tony. Uh, Tony's question is, what is your suggestion for after all of the coaching that you've done results in no improvement, but you want to retain this manager? How do you re recommend and assist them in gracefully stepping back? Yeah. Okay. So you coach him up or you coach him out. Um, that's, I, I think, essentially what we're, what we're talking about here. I, so if you're trying to coach someone to improve, they're not improving. Um, I have to think that the reason why you would want them to improve is because they're doing something that is detrimental. Um, if they're just, you know, going to ride out the next few years and then they're going to retire or whatever and they're not harming anything, Fine. That's what you do. A lot of organizations do that. They, they have them write out those last couple of years. But I'm assuming that if you're asking them to improve in something, then something's not going right. So I would challenge that belief that you have to keep them there um, and that you have to keep them in the organization. And I would challenge you to believe that you can coach them out into something. And maybe um, not knowing uh, the whole situation, but I've seen a number of organizations that help to move out a level of leadership that is unable to change, unwilling to change, meet new um, kind of standards for leadership, and they create different roles for them outside of their traditional role. They might become maybe mentors for emerging leaders in certain areas where they can develop them and help them and understand the history of the organization, the vision of the organization. But when I hear that, I, I, as a coach, I obviously want to know more about the details, but I would say you either coach them up or you coach them out. Um, usually it doesn't work to keep people that aren't improving and aren't growing and don't have that growth mindset. That fixed mindset can be a cancer in an organization, and I would, I would challenge you to really think about that, whether that's the right move to make. Sorry, that's the All coaching right. me coming out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, Dan. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time. I know you stepped in um, kind of last minute, but uh, we you really, bet. really appreciate you being here. I thought a lot of great information was shared and the comments that were coming in from the audience reflect reflect that thought as well. So thank you so much for stepping in and Wonderful. taking the reins here today. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. Great presentation. We had a lot of people on the line. We had a ton of questions. We were not even able to get to even half of them. Um, we would have needed at least another hour to answer every question that came in. But we do have them all recorded, everybody. So thank you for all joining, and thank you all for your participation. Um, again, thank you to Building Champions for sponsoring this event today. 
it's always a pleasure to work with building champions on these webinars and beyond. So we really appreciate their support here at CLO on our webinar program and beyond, like I said. So thanks again to building champions. Again, thank you, Dan. We'll see everybody back here for our next CLO webinar coming up on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, titled, Is It Time to Reshape Your Leader Leadership Development Strategy? So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you, Alex.